Okay, and Roberta, can I please hand it over to you? Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Roberta Greenstein, a member of the board of the Jewish Museum of Maryland. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's presentation of Forgotten Land with Lisa Cooper. I, tonight's program is one of the only presentations from the before COVID times that we have been able to reschedule. As you are about to see, our collective embracing of technology and especially Zoom is key in making tonight possible as our speaker is joining us for, from her home in England. As many of you will already know, one of the things about the JMM is our passion for storytelling. We strive to find, tell, and protect the stories of Maryland's Jewish communities. As such, when we learned about Lisa's book and the way in which it could share stories of life in the Jewish pale, we couldn't resist. As a reminder, you can purchase your own copy of the book through the JMM virtual store, and we will post a link in chat at the close of the program. Now to our speaker. Lisa Cooper is a British writer, journalist, and artist. She studied Russian at Edinburgh University and spent a year in the Soviet Union as a student. Armed with an address dating from the 1960s and a family tree, she made contact with cousins in Kiev, then, then part of Soviet Ukraine, who introduced her to a web of relatives she knew nothing about. The experience helped breed an interest in both family history and Ukrainian Jewish history. Her book was originally conceived as a dissertation for a master's degree in Russian history. Lisa, welcome to the Virtual Jewish Museum of Maryland. Mm -hmm. Roberta, thank you very much. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, so um, welcome everybody. Thank you for, for joining us. Um, so the book I'm going to be talking about is my grandmother's story. Um, it's also a typical Jewish American story, although you might not um, have guessed that from my accent. So my grandmother's name was Pearl. Um, I hope you can now see her on the screen. If somebody can let me know if that's not working. Um, you should be able to see the front cover of the book. And that's Pearl circling her in the, in the center, the girl with the, the long hair in the center of the picture. Um, so Pearl was born in the Russian Empire in a small town called Pavlich, about 60 miles from Kiev um, in present day Ukraine. But she lived for, for the last 30 or so years of her life in Los Angeles in a small apartment that she shared with her sister Rachel. And that was the only home of my grandmother's that I ever knew. And I do remember it vividly, even though we lived in England and, uh, and so we visited only very rarely during my childhood. But I'm going to tell the story of Pearl's life back in Russia in the early part of the 20th century. It was a very dramatic period of Russian history, a period of great upheaval, terrible suffering, and especially for Jews. Um, but it's also a story of remarkable resilience and of bravery and hope. And it's a story of ordinary people trying to lead ordinary lives, but in very extraordinary times. So this picture on the front cover of the book would have been taken around 1914, so probably just before the start of, of World War I. And Pearl's father, the, the chap on the left with the, the skull cap, um, he died just a few years after that. So Pavlich, the town where Pearl lived, was a melting pot of different nationalities and religions. And Pearl grew up speaking Yiddish, um, but also her language was intermingled with smatterings of Polish, Ukrainian and Russian. On her mother's side, the family were prosperous grain dealers. And on her father's side, they were religious scholars who were very poor, but being scholars, they were very, very highly regarded in the Jewish community. And Pearl's mother died when she was uh, just six years old. So this is a picture of Pearl's mother. Uh, Pearl's the little girl standing um, on the floor in the center. Her older sister, Sarah, up on the chair and her brother, Nathan, the baby on the lap. Um, so after, after Pearl's mother died, she was brought up by her grandparents, Beryl and Pessy, in a large house that also served as a warehouse for her grandfather's grain business. 
And my grandmother was the second of four children. Um, so after this photo was taken, another uh, little girl, Rahul, uh, was born. And she was the aunt who my grandmother lived with when, when I was young. Um, but they also lived with two cousins, two younger cousins. Um, and all four, all, sorry, all six of these children were orphaned young, um, leaving them in the care of their grandparents. Um, so this is her grandmother, um, Pessy, Bubba Pessy, as she was known. Now, Bubba Pessy was terrified of the evil eye, which I'm sure some of, you, some of you will be familiar with. It was the bane of all Jewish grandmothers and grandmothers. Um, so the evil eye, if, if something bad happened in the family, if a child got sick or, you know, a business uh, failed or whatever, um, that, would, that would have been because the, somebody had cast an evil eye on, on somebody in the family. Um, and what you had to do if an evil eye was, was cast, you had to go and see the local expert who would be able to, um, to expel the evil eye and get everything back to normal. Um, so I imagine it being a bit like going to see a, a witch doctor. So apparently you had to take a thread from the clothing of the person who you believe cast the evil eye and put that thread into a pot over burning coals. And uh, this witch doctor type person would... Um, would mutter incantations and spit three times and that would get rid of the evil eye. And Pessy also believed that a camera by um, having a photo taken that could also cast an evil eye. So the only, she, this is the earliest photo that we have of her. Um, and I think she probably by this stage that I'm old now, so, so what the heck, I'll be okay. I'll, I'll let myself be photographed. And if, if I get the evil eye, then so be it. Um, so before Pearl was born, and in particular in the period 1881 to 1905, the Pale of Settlement, that was the area where the Jews were restricted to living under the Tsars, um, the Pale saw terrible violence against the Jews, the pogroms as we know them. And the pogroms were tolerated and even, and even encouraged by the Tsar. I'm going to give some readings from the book. This is my first reading. Um, and this is... Um, in 1881, so there's the start of the pogroms. Huh, that'll serve the man right, were my grandfather's first words when he heard of the explosion that had killed Tsar Alexander II. Although the Tsar had achieved a reputation as a great reformer for freeing the serfs, Beryl grumbled that he hadn't done so much to emancipate the Jews. It was true that our people gained some limited freedoms under his rule. Forced conscription of children was halted. More Jews were able to attend Russian schools and universities, but emancipation this most definitely was not. My grandfather was soon eating his words, however, for the events that ensued rocked the lives not just of my family, but of every single Jew right across the pale. After the Tsar's assassination, rumours began to spread. To begin with, the Jews weren't aware of the gossip and whispering. It took place surreptitiously, inside houses in the Christian parts of towns. But then it spread to shops, the markets and the train stations. The rumours were everywhere. It was Jewish, Jewish revolutionaries that had killed the Tsar and it was time for revenge. Inebriated mobs pulled down market stalls, smashed shop windows and kicked in doors in towns and cities across the pale. Velvet dresses and woolen shawls, picture frames and broken chair legs, cabbages and bottled plums, all were trampled underfoot or piled up in grotesque mountains of mud. And everywhere there was screaming, running feet, fearful faces trying to stay out of sight. A snowstorm of white feathers cascaded out of windows and hovered in the air, having been ripped from the confines of mattresses and pillows. Some of the rioters dressed themselves up in new outfits stolen from the ready-made clothes stores, piling one layer over another, shirts over jackets and underwear over trousers until they looked like characters in some absurd stage play. How to count the cost? How many honest traders and merchants bankrupted? How many families bereft of all that they had spent their whole lives working towards? And how many children so traumatized that they would forever relive the fear in their dreams? So as I said, that was in 1881. And these waves of violence against the Jews were repeated regularly over the next few years. And eventually they died down again until a major, a second major wave of pogroms began in 1905. And that was the year when the first major signs of revolution 
uh, were felt in Russia. The Russian Revolution, as we know it, didn't take place till 1917, some 12 years later. But 1905 saw rebellions and uprisings and workers striking, marching through the streets, um, protesting about the discrimination, um, sorry, marching through the streets and waving red banners. And lots of Jews joined in the marching and the demonstrations, protesting about the discrimination that still affected their daily lives. And once again, just like the last time, this caused, caused an anti-Semitic backlash, the fact that so many Jews had been involved in, in the 1905 revolution. And this time, it was even more bloody than in, in 1881. As well as raiding Jewish shops and businesses, the so-called Black Hundreds killed Jews in their own homes, and they even hacked people to death in the streets. But most of the violence was restricted to the major towns and cities, and small towns like Pavlich, where my family lived, were generally spared. Although people lived with the fear that, of what was going on elsewhere, um, they generally continued to lead an ordinary life. And I've got two readings um, about what life was like in my grandmother's childhood. So here she is to begin with, uh, talking about her day-to-day -day life as a child. <clears throat> I had few cares as a young child. Just as my mother had been cosseted in her youth, my sister Sarah and I were brought up like the daughters of a princess. Our mother shunned the local tailor, and instead we travelled to the town of Berdichev to visit the dressmaker who made us fashion fashionable outfits fringed with velvet and lace. I loved these visits to the city. I was always enthralled by the clamour of the market traders and the horse-drawn streetcars that clattered along the cobblestones. And then there was the excitement of collecting our new clothes. We believed that we'd be the best dressed girls in all of Pavlich. Like our mother before us, we girls were never taught to sew or darn or cook. Grandmother was responsible for looking after the needs of the entire household, as well as helping grandfather by collecting the takings from his warehouse and keeping his books up to date. A tiny, energetic woman whose life sorrow was reflected in her eyes. And here she is on the screen now. He was the linchpin of the family. And Baba never let a second go to waste. Every morning she would rise at daybreak to milk her cow, light the fires and then set to work on the kitchen floor, scrubbing the flagstones until they sparkled. As her children and grandchildren washed and dressed, she prepared the table for breakfast. The kitchen was her domain and she ruled it just as strictly and efficiently as grandfather ran his warehouse. In any quiet moment, she was always to be found there, knitting needles clicking, a ball of wool trailing across the floor as she engaged in the never-ending task of knitting and darning the family's socks and stockings. And my second um, reading about life um, in my grandmother's childhood is uh, it gives a bit of an insight into her grandfather's life as a as a grain dealer and how people did business in those days. And sadly, I don't have any photos of her grandfather. And I believe he, he, would have, he would have thought sitting before a photographer had been too frivolous and he, wouldn't have, he would have sort of poo-pooed the whole idea. Um, he, was a, he was a pretty serious man and a pretty fierce man by, by all accounts. But this is what he got up to. International commerce in an era before telephones and without established rates of exchange was a complex and time-consuming affair. Every day, my grandfather. Sorry, every day, my grandfather's driver waited with a coach and horse to take him to the train station in Popilna, a small town 12 miles from Pavlich, where he would await news from each train that passed of the prices currently being paid for different products further up or down the line. Market rates in Kiev and export prices in Odessa, the region's major port. The railway station was a daunting place for outsiders. When I was little, I occasionally travelled to visit relatives by train with my parents. This is, this is obviously my grandmother speaking in my grandmother's voice. I remember dodging between the swarms of traders from all over the area who congregated to discuss prices and close deals with travelling businessmen. My father would scoop me up in his arms so I didn't get lost or trampled, and the noise was so loud, with fren frenzied shouts and hand gestures from all sides, that I couldn't understand how anybody was able to follow what was going on. But everything changed in 1914 when the war broke out. And so my grandmother 
was 12 years old at the start of the First World War. And although the battlefields were thousands of miles away from Pavlich, the war still had a profound effect on the town and, and on the lives of everybody who lived there. And the comfortable life that my grandmother had led up to that point was shattered once and for all. And one of the first changes that they, that they would have noticed had a huge effect on Pearl's grandfather's grain business. The page isn't the page doesn't want to show up. Um, so this is um, the start of the war. After Germany declared war in 1914, the train station in, in at Popilna changed from a stock exchange to an army embarkation point. Goods trains no longer brought news of grain prices from Kiev and Odessa, but transported mit military apparel to the distant front, and passenger services were replaced by troop carriers. Instead of throbbing with merchants and speculators, the train stations were drenched in the tears of mothers, wives and children, waving their beloved goodbye as they ran along the platform until it ended and they could run no further. Instead of talk of prices, bushels, foods and exchanges, all conversation was of mobilisation, detachments, regiments and ultimatums. My grandfather's routine was disrupted without his trips to the station. Although the scope of his business no longer required him to visit Popilna every day, he still undertook the journey once or twice a week. Now even this was denied him, and he began to pace around the house restlessly. He missed his outings and the social contact they provided, and he despaired of the murkiness that was settling over grain prices. The daily dealings at the train station had kept pricing transparent. Dealers knew how much was being paid for each pro product at every location. Now it was impossible to keep track. To make matters worse, inflation had started to increase, making it more important than ever to keep a close eye on the market. But exchange rates, tariffs and prices were all becoming harder and harder to gauge. They rose gradually at first, then faster and faster, until they were running out of control, like a downhill sledge on an icy track. And all over Pavlich, families were fearful of their menfolk being sent off to war. And some of my grandmother's older cousins had already managed to escape Canada, to escape to Canada to avoid being called up by the military authorities. And once the war started, it was too late to, to escape. But still, many men tried to evade conscription at all costs. And this was my family's experience. Thankfully, my father, my father wasn't called up to fight in the first months of the war, as the menfolk of Pavlich marched off to the station to fill the never-ending lines of trains heading for the front. I prayed every night and every day that my father wouldn't one day join them. He wasn't meant for fighting, this gentle, studious man who still dressed every day in his long black coat and skull cap. The first wave of recruits were green ticketers. My father hoped to be granted a blue ticket, which would mean he was allowed to study rather than go to war. Only the feeble-minded and the infirm were lucky enough to be granted a white ticket, which exempted them altogether, while those who failed the medical exams were red ticketers. Pavlich was full of young men trying to make themselves ill by fasting, drinking salty water or overindulging in salted herring to gain a red ticket. The rich took a different tack, by bribing doctors or officials to reject their sons. Meanwhile, the mothers of one or two young men we knew ran themselves ragged, going from one office to another through the warren of Russian officialdom, trying to prove that their last remaining boy should get the automatic exemption that applied to only sons. The official registers were notoriously inaccurate and many hadn't been updated properly when people died or emigrated. But the process of verifying that a son was unavailable for service could cause weeks of frustration and distress. Now, avoiding conscription was, was nothing new, um, and particularly for Jewish families, as Jews on the whole were um, a studious, kind of peace-loving people. And I mean, in, in our family, we've got numerous examples of people, um, of, the, the, of the, the males in the family, uh, trying to avoid conscription. The Pearl's uh, great-grandfather, Akiva, uh, to avoid conscription to the Crimean War, he had all his teeth pulled out um, back in the, the mid-1800s. 
because if you didn't have a have a suitable number of teeth, then the child's army wouldn't take you. Um, and um, sons of so then, as I mentioned, some some family members had already managed to escape to Canada to avoid uh, conscription. So those were the sons of. Um, of Pearl's grandfather's brother, who actually they were very close because they shared a house together, and our fam our side of the family lived in one side, and um, and the grandfather's brother's family lived in the other side, um, and they managed to get to Canada in 1914. They were in a bit of a race against time, as to what would arrive first, their their military call up papers or their uh, Canadian. Um, authorization papers and they did manage to get out being before um, before they were forced to go into the army um, and later uh, Pearl's brother uh, Nathan Naftila as he was known in Russia and he was the little baby sitting uh, sitting on his mother's lap um, in that photo there he um, he was uh, called up in 1920 into the Red Army, the Soviet Red Army, for their first overseas incursion into Poland. And uh, it's an, another whole story altogether, how he finally did manage to get to Canada. It took him about three years um, to, to finally make it. And um, also, quite interestingly, um, the, our family name, I go back to here, is, is Unikow, Pearl Unikow Cooper. Um, Unikov, it would have been in Russia, that's not that's not a Jewish name. That's a Ukrainian name. And the reason my family had that name was because um, Pearl's father, um, his father and uncle, they were two brothers. And to avoid conscription, this would have been to the um, Russo-Turkish War in the 1860s, I believe. Um, at that point. Um, if you were an only son, you were exempt from the draft. And there were two brothers. So they managed to organise a kind of false adoption. So one of the boys got adopted, or young men, got adopted by a Ukrainian family in, in legal terms. Obviously, it wasn't a, a genuine adoption. And they and took the name Unikow. Um, and the other brother kept the family name Shapira. Um, and that that was another ruse to to evade conscription, and ended up in us getting this this rather bizarre uh, Ukrainian family name. Uh, but with World War One, um, life became harder for those left at home as food and equipment were sent away to the front, leaving little to spare for for those left back in Russia. But thanks to Pearl's grandfather's grain business, my family did still have enough to eat. But in the cities at this time, people were going hungry and with, it, with insufficient fuel available for people to heat their homes, many people got sick. And the war dragged on year after year after year and the hardships increased for the ordinary people of Russia. In the major cities, uh, these hardships led to massive unrest, culminating eventually in the revolutions of 1917. So the revolution began in February, the February Revolution, when the Tsar was overthrown. And this was followed later on when the Bolsheviks seized power in what we know as the October Revolution. So small towns like Pavlich were fairly immune from the revolutionary fervour. Uh, but I've got a description here of what was going on in Kiev. So this was about 60 miles away from where my family lived. And this was at the time of the February Revolution, the time um, when the Tsar was forced to, to abdicate. People, talk, people talked openly, fearlessly in the streets about the end of the Tsar's reign. They talked about Russia withdrawing from the war and abandoning her allies. Power to the workers, people Soviets. Students handed out leaflets and waved red banners. What did it all mean? Would the war soon be over? Could the Tsar just resign? How can the workers take power? And what were the Soviets? To a 15-year-old girl in a small country town, the reports from the city were all very mysterious. But far away to the north in Petrograd, as the Russian capital was now called, the demonstrations were coming to a head, and at last they culminated in the Tsar's abdication. It was as if a black cloud had lifted from above our heads. Alexander Kerensky and the provisional government filled the power void left by Tsar Nicholas and represented everything we'd ever hoped for. 
My sister Sarah came home from school early, rejoicing that she would no longer have to sing the national anthem. The hated God Save the Tsar was now banned. The Pale of Settlement, that area where the Jews were forced to live, was dissolved at a single blow. Censorship was abolished and my grandfather began devouring newspapers and any other source of information that he could find. Hungry for news that had not for news that had not previously been considered fit for public consumption. Kerensky has come and it's like, a, it's like a blessing, my grandfather repeated again and again to anyone who would listen. No more Tsar, no more restrictions on Jewish jobs and residence permits. Now we have the same rights as everybody else in the country. I didn't understand the politics of it all, but I could feel the difference in my daily life. The mood of oppression that had settled over Pavlich since the beginning of the war was suddenly lifted. People smiled, they chatted, laughed, they talked about their hopes and dreams, they voiced aspirations that they'd never had dared speak of before. Some even danced in the street. My grandfather was more cheerful than, than he had been in years, and my grandmother's eyes sparkled in a way that I'd hardly ever seen. We're free, my children, we're free, she laughed when she first heard the news, scurrying around the room, hugging each of her grandchildren in turn. But Kerensky's leadership of the country was all too brief, and it was ended by the Bolshevik Revolution that October. Now, for ordinary people, the October Revolution caused great uncertainty. Ukraine was far, far away from Petrograd, St. Petersburg, as we know it today, uh, where the Bolshevik Revolution took place. And really, nobody knew very much about Lenin and his fellow revolutionaries. Certainly nobody at that time could have envisaged that they and their heirs would have remained in power for most of the 20th century. But one of the first things that the Bol Bolsheviks did was to extricate Russian troops from the war. And this really had a huge effect on places like Pavlich. Over the weeks that followed, the railways became a teeming mass of humanity. Not even my grandfather would dare go to the train station in Popilna now. His once daily haunt was heaving with unwashed bodies, many racked with disease and crawling with lice as soldiers dribbled back home from distant lands, weak, thin and bedraggled like stray cats after a storm. From the window I watched the slow trudging progress through town of these grey bundles of bones, men who had once represented the Tsar's brave army. Townsfolk put, took pity on the returning troops and went out of their way to offer them soup and give them any old clothes or shoes that they could spare. Even after three and a half years of wartime hardships, it was clear that the privation we had all suffered was nothing compared with the needs of the soldiers. But week after week, the ragged creatures kept on coming, more and more of them, until people began to worry that if they kept giving their food and clothing away, they would have nothing left. And as the months passed, the reality dawned that the pale, unshaven men crisscrossing the countryside with guns couldn't all be soldiers returning to their homes after all. So who were these men? It eventually became clear that bands of armed thugs were roaming the land. It was impossible to tell who was who, but gradually all those generous souls in Pavlich who'd been wel welcoming the soldiers home with hot soup instead began hiding away their potatoes and their winter boots, lest the men take them all. And the other thing that the Bolsheviks did after they gained power was to start requisitioning grain from the countryside to feed the workers, as well as taking the grain from the peasants. Uh, they also raided the supplies of grain merchants like Pearl's grandfather. So this is what happened to him. The Bolsheviks, viewed the Bolsheviks viewed merchants like my grandfather as class enemies. They also needed grain to feed their supporters in the cities, which were running out of food. Grandfather knew that a knock at the door was inevitable, but when it came, he was still caught by surprise. My grandparents knew young Vanya well. He was Sasha the baker's son and lived down the road. They'd watched him grow up from a wailing baby in his mother's arms to a smart young schoolboy and later a recruit in the Tsar's army. When he, came home, when he came to the house, Baba almost shrieked as she pulled open the door. She barely recognised him in the black leather coat that reached down to his calves and his heavy black boots. In his hand was a wooden truncheon. He was surrounded by a group of youths, all in identical black garb, 
talking loudly to one another, but Vanya was clearly their leader. My grandfather hurried to the door, alerted by the commotion and the rush of cold air. Vanya, he exclaimed, what are you doing here, young man? Vanya looked a bit sheepish, perhaps embarrassed, embarrassed that his fellow Bolsheviks should see that he had associated them in the past with class enemies like my grandfather. One of his red guards, one of his red guards brushed Baba aside and headed towards the warehouse. The Bolsheviks are in charge now, and we need to take your grain to feed the workers in the towns, the youth dictated as he stamped through the house. But what about us? Who will feed us if you take away our grain? Baba countered. You bourgeois, you're all the same. The workers and the peasants need bread if they're going to build socialism. Bread, land and freedom. Grandfather just sat in his chair and watched as Vanya and his friends shoveled away his already diminished pyramids of grain until all that was left was a few thin scatterings of yellow spread across the grey stone floor like dirt that had come in from the street and needed sweeping up. He knew he couldn't argue with them. He'd heard the news on the grapevine. Grain merchants all over Ukraine were having their stores ransacked. It was clear that from that day on, our lives would never be the same again. Now, although the Bolsheviks had pulled Russia out of the war, um, what they'd failed to do was to deliver peace. And all over Ukraine and other parts of the Russian Empire, the October Revolution gave way to anarchy, with newly formed bands of rebels and fighters crisscrossing the land. Each group had a different allegiance. Some were fighting for nationalism, some for anarchism, for holy Russia, or sometimes it seemed really just for the sake of fighting. And this was the start of the civil war. Pavlich in the surrounding area was the scene of many battles and atrocities from 1918 to 1920. And I'm going to recount now just one of the many incidents that took place in Pavlich during that time. Um, this particular incident involved the White Army, sorry, involved the White Army under the Cossack leader General Denikin. And the Cossacks were fiercely anti-Bolshevik, but they were also fiercely anti-Semitic. Um, Five huge men burst in through the front door. They were clad in tatty grey coats that reached almost to the floor. Grease pencil marks indicated their rank, outlining stars that had once been sewn onto their shoulder straps. Long shining swords were tucked into their belts and they carried rifles fixed with rusty bayonets. The tops of their heads almost touched the ceiling and with each great stride, they squeezed my grandparents into the corners of the room where they cowered shaking. The whites weren't like the anarchists who burst in and began smashing the furniture to pieces. They had brains and intuition that they used to figure out just where their victims might be hiding money or jewellery or hoarding food. The soldiers sniffed around like dogs, tapping at walls and floorboards, listening for a hollow echo that might indicate a hiding place. Money, give us your money, old man, the first giant had demanded in Russian, prodding my grandfather with his bayonet. Grandfather's carefully learned Russian seemed to desert him, and he mumbled something incomprehensible, his eyes fixed on the scuffed leather boots of his interrogator. While his companions continued to search the house, kicking down the door to the warehouse, the leader of the group dealt my grandfather a swift blow with his rifle butt and watched poor grandfather crumple to the floor like a rag doll. Then he kicked him in the stomach with his huge leather boots until grandfather curled into a ball on the hard kitchen floor, as pitiful as a tiny child. Again and again, he beat him with his gun and kicked him. By that time, the other four soldiers had returned. Zayda wasn't a big man, so it didn't take them long to come onto the table, pull his scuffed leather belt from around his waist and force his head into the noose that they made with it. Then they hanged him from the hook on the kitchen ceiling that were used for drying meat. And he survived. Um, grandfather survived uh, because the belt that he was being hanged with snapped and he landed with a great thud on the floor. Um, and um, my grandfather told, uh, my, sorry, my, my grandmother told a story um, earlier on in her, during her childhood. And she was quite a fierce man, her, her grandfather. And during the Sabbath meal, he used to, um, every week, he, he kind of made a, a little uh, ritual 
of beating his children with it with um with his leather belt and um he'd he'd accuse them of something and and give them a whack with this belt and uh so it's quite a nice thought that maybe all those beatings that he gave his his uh, grandchildren when they were younger was what actually saved his life um later on um but uh, as i said before that really that was just one of many many incidents there's there was another incident where uh, pearl and her grandfather were hiding in hiding the rest of the family had disappeared somewhere much safer and they they were in the attic of their house um, when one of these banda, as my grandmother called them, when, when the banda came. And Pearl had fallen and broken her leg and so she had her, her leg in a cast and wasn't able to, to run or could barely walk. Um, and the banda were getting closer and they were getting more and more scared. And grandfather went off to get a neighbour um, who was bigger and stronger than him. He said, I'm going to get the neighbour and he's going to bring you to safety. He can carry you. Um, so grandfather disappeared. Pearl was left waiting on her own. And she had a shot ring out very, very close by. And that gunshot was the neighbour who was shot dead when he was coming to rescue her. And she survived. The whole family survived. And the neighbour who was coming to do them a favour um, died. Um, uh, I mean, every family who lived through these times will have numerous stories like this. Um, now, by 1920... The Bolsheviks' grip on power in the, UK and had, in the Ukraine had become stronger and the fighting and the raids had started to die down, although they still hadn't yet stopped altogether. But what followed after this was a period of great hunger and deprivation. The Bolshevik government continued to requisition food supplies from the countryside. And even in the Ukraine, which was known as the breadbasket of Europe because of its huge, huge grain production, it was next to impossible to buy wheat or flour. And the Bolsheviks didn't just requisition the grain, they also took the seed, um, which made it impossible for the peasants to grow crops the following year. The only bread that you could buy at the time was on the black market, and I've got a lovely quote, just a very short one, about black market bread. People said that flour made up only 5% of the loaf. The rest was a revolting blend of dried potato skins, mashed up soldiers' coats, or even dirt and mud from the road. It stuck to the roof of the mouth and trying to cut it with a bread knife was a wasted effort. You needed a saw. Even so, if someone was unwise enough to go out in the street holding a piece of bread, children would steal it straight from their hands. And as well as bread, sugar, potatoes, eggs, milk, all of these were unavailable or prohibitive, prohibitively expensive. And that's not to mention meat. And inflation was pushing up prices by the day. And that reached a point where barter became the main means of doing business and it became increasingly difficult for families to find enough food to eat. Then my grandmother at this time took on the role of finding food to feed her family. She wasn't yet 20 years old but both her parents were dead um, and her grandparents were getting old and especially her grandfather after his experience um, at the hands of the Cossacks were obviously he was he was no longer he was weak and no longer in a position to to look after the family. Um, so to enable her grandparents and her siblings and her cousins uh, to survive, Pearl took on this role of making terrifying and dangerous journeys by train across the country, across the area um, to, to different markets uh, where she could buy and sell and barter food. Now this is a picture of um, what she looked like at that time. This is Pearl on the left. Um, these markets that she travelled to were illegal and if she was caught she most likely would have been shot. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about um, what she what she started going through at this time and these sort of incredibly dangerous life that she led really for the next three years of her life. It was still several years before regular train services to, re to re before regular train services were to resume. There were no timetables and no carriages for passengers. It wasn't possible to just buy a ticket and climb aboard. In fact, officially, ordinary people weren't allowed on board at all. Trains appeared whenever their cargoes of goods or troops were ready. This meant sometimes they travelled through Papilna to Kiev or Odessa three times a day, and other times it was more like three times a week. Every so often they stopped at our station, but on many occasions they didn't. 
If the train didn't stop, I had to leap aboard while it was moving and cling on for dear life until I had the chance to find a better spot on a footplate between carriages, perched on top of a freight car or crouching in the corner of an empty wagon. I learned how to leap into the doorway of a freight car, to aim for the gap between the wagons, or even, if the train was travelling slowly enough, to crawl in between the wheels and work my way up to the carriage roof. Not only were traders at risk of being attacked or robbed, but officials were known to offer bribes to informers, and in return for a hunk of bread or a handful of rubles, any of these people could report me to the authorities for dealing in contraband goods. So to avoid the risk, I threw myself off the train before reaching the station and gave the whole area a wide berth. Jumping off was much worse than boarding the train in the first place. At least in winter, deep drifts of snow lay either side of the train tracks, creating a soft bed to land in. But when spring arrived, the embankments were piled high with blackened slush, which towered above deep puddles that I had to try and avoid. And later in summer, when the ground was hard, I came home spotted with inky bruises where I'd hit the ground. And Pearl spent three years uh, travelling on trains like this to illegal markets, buying, selling, bartering, whatever she could to feed, whatever she could get her hands on uh, to, to feed her family or to sell back in Pavlovich, um, sometimes staying away overnight. And on one very memorable occasion, she got caught in a snowstorm and almost died from the cold. And she was finally managed to, she finally managed to reach a, a village where there was a Jewish woman who lived in the village who took her in and looked after her and fed her uh, for, for several days until she was able to get home. Um, and when she finally did make it home, her grandparents thought it was a ghost. They thought it was a ghost of their granddaughter uh, coming home because they'd given her up for, for dead. Um, but being very small, uh, she was often able to hide in places where she could eavesdrop on the conversations that other traders like herself were having. And that way she could gain insights and information about where certain goods might be available and use that information to her own advantage. So eventually, through, um, through doing this, believe it or not, she became a black market gold dealer. So my final reading um, tells us a little bit about that. My grandparents collected coins, rings, medals, jewellery, any gold that family, friends or acquaintances still had. Young women gave earrings and bracelets that they had been saving for their wedding trousseau. Mothers offered medals awarded to their dead sons for bravery. Wives even gave up their wedding rings. All these goods were given to my grandparents on trust and hidden in secret compartments that Baba sewed into my tattered coat. I took the gold hundreds of miles away to Kharkov. The journey was murderous. Once I'd jumped off the train in Kiev, I had to work my way across to the other side of the jumble of stinking huts that made up the main station and leap aboard a train heading east. The trains were a different design from those travelling between Kiev and Odessa, and they offered no means of climbing onto the roof, nor even inside the carriages. Instead, I perched on the wooden boards that ran across the wheel axles. There was very little space. Icy wind whistled straight through me, and the noise of the wheels on the tracks was almost deafening. But these tiny platforms were in great demand. Hands clawed at me and clung to my arms. Occasionally, with a sinister howl, the train would jerk or break fiercely and somebody tumble from the platform. It would have been almost impossible not to fall under the wheels. Even if the train didn't stop, it took all day to reach Kharkov. More often, it stopped repeatedly in the middle of nowhere, the endless miles of woodland revealing nothing of our location. But I never dared jump down to stretch my legs. It was too risky. There was no timetable to, time to indicate when the train might move again. And besides, I was fearful of losing my precious spot above the wheels. If I gave it up, the other travellers might never let me back on board. At the end of each journey, I thanked God that I was still alive. Once, once in Kharkov, through a complex network of contacts, I was introduced to some shady dealers who asked me to follow them to the back of the market. I with nerves the first time I stepped behind the brick wall that separated me from the other market traders who might have offered some protection. The men were gruff but brisk, well-dressed if not well-mannered. They inspected my goods meticulously, then handed over hard currency in return. I hid the money away carefully in my secret pockets before stepping back into the marketplace. Now, if, if she'd been caught with either the gold or the hard currency, uh, the penalty would have been the same. She would, she would have been shot.
Uh, my grandmother wasn't the only person traveling illegally on the trains. Thousands of other people were doing exactly the same thing, taking enormous risks just to try and enable their families to have enough food to eat. And finally, grandma could take it no more. She felt that she just had to escape from this terrifying life that she hated with a passion. And many Jews had emigrated from Russia during the years of the pogroms. The first of our relatives to leave Russia had come to Canada in 1903 and settled in Winnipeg. And then, as I mentioned, subsequent family members came to avoid conscription. And finally, in 1924, Pearl managed to go and join them in Canada. And over the course of the year or so, she managed to, ra she managed to raise enough money to bring the rest of her family to join her there. So here's a photo of um, all the family together in Winnipeg. Baba Pessy uh, in the middle there surrounded by all her grandchildren. Um, they all lived together and Pessy controlled the purse strings and she looked after the family. She continued to cook and look after the house just as she had in Pavlich. Um, and one thing to note about Pessy is just how incredibly old um, she looks. And uh, yet we know that she was only about 65 when she died. And it's just testament to the terribly hard life that, um, that people led in those days. And not only that, the fact that, that Pessy actually gave birth to no fewer than 13 children, of whom only two lived into adulthood. And that's uh, my great grandmother and uh, the mother of the two cousins. Who, who lived with, with, uh, with Pearl. And both of those sisters died young in their 20s, uh, which is why uh, the, the children lived with their grandparents. Um, now, Pessy in this photo is wearing black, and that's because there's one person, two people in fact won't, but uh, she's wearing black because her grandfather is, is missing. He died, sadly, uh, before... Um, uh, but before the, the rest of the family could come over to join Pearl. And that upset Pearl greatly because he'd given her everything. He'd given her any money he could. And when she had her doubts about whether she could leave and how they would survive without her, you know, buying and selling and doing all this bartering, he was the one who insisted that she go. And she said later, he gave me my, he, he, he gave me his soul so that she could leave. Um, and my story finishes, um, in 1926, when Pearl gets married, and um, this is her and her husband Itzik, my grandfather, on their wedding day. Um, this is 1926, um, and then shortly after this, my aunt Lil, probably about nine months afterwards, my aunt Lil was born, and six years later, my dad uh, was born. Now, Pearl moved to L.A. in 1955 after my aunt Lil and my father had both ended up in California. Um, and as I said, by the, by the time I knew my grandmother, and I never knew her terribly well because we lived so far away, um, she was living in a little apartment in West Hollywood on the second floor of a block built around a swimming pool. And she was this tiny, tiny, fragile, stooped old lady. This is what uh, grandma looked like in the 70s when, when, I, when I knew her. Um, and writing her story so long after she died, I, I just found it incredibly hard to equate the person recounting these stories with my grandma. She was so tiny and frail. I simply couldn't imagine how she could have jumped on and off trains, how she could have endured all those physical hardships that she did. Um, the other thing that I found amazing was thinking how she and I, just two generations apart, had led such vastly different lives. And of course, how close to death she came on so many occasions. And if she hadn't survived, then of course I wouldn't be here now. Um, before I finish, I'm just going to um, show a few, a, few sharp, a few slides quickly of some pictures of Pavlich and the surrounding area that I took when I visited uh, Pavlich with my dad back in 2005. Um, and this is the, the synagogue, uh, which is now a museum. But while these pictures are running, I'd just like to say a few words about how this book came about. And I've got my dad to thank for that. My dad was a historian um, and he studied at UCLA uh, before he won a scholarship to Cambridge University um, in 1959 and emigrated to England. And that's where he met my mum. And that's how I, and I turned out to be English. Um, Dad later became a history professor in a city called Norwich, um, which is where I grew up. 
And back in the 1970s, when Pearl was an old lady, Dad made recordings in Yiddish on old cassette tapes of her telling stories about her life back in Russia. And we're very lucky that Grandma was a great storyteller. Unlike so many Jewish immigrants who came to the West and refused to talk about the old country, uh, most people chose to forget the unhappy times and not to pass on their memories. Um, and when I was younger, I knew of the existence of these tapes that Dad had recorded, but I didn't know Yiddish. And as a child, I'd never been sufficiently interested to ask Dad to translate them. But then, um, as Roberta said in the introduction, I was studying for a master's in Russian history, and I thought it might be interesting to write my dissertation about the Russian Civil War, which I knew that Grandma had lived through. And it was then that I asked my dad to translate these tapes. So hour after hour, Dad translated while I typed, and I was just simply astounded by the stories. I'd had absolutely no idea what my grandmother and her family had gone through. And at that point, um, I decided to ditch the dissertation and the masters and sat about turning Grandma's story into a, into a book. Now, if you'd like to hear a few snippets from the cassettes and hear some more of Pearl's stories in her own words, you might be interested in a short radio documentary um, that I made with the BBC a couple of years ago. Um, the URL is on the screen there. And... Um, I think uh, if you've registered for this uh, webinar, then you will be receiving an email with the recording and we'll make sure that the, um, the web link um, is in that email as well. Um, so that, that's, that might be worth a listen. And the other thing, just before I um, finish, is um, the other thing you might be interested in is that I write a blog on my website um, relating to historical topics about the, the Jewish, about Jewish life, um, and things of Jewish interest uh, in Ukraine and Eastern Europe. Um, so you might be interested to have a look. Again, we'll put the web link in the, um, in the email that you'll be receiving. And you can scroll down and subscribe to receive an email um, with each new article as it appears. You can also search for the articles by category um, if you're interested in doing that. So I think we've, we've just got a little bit of time for some questions. Um, I don't know if somebody, um, if Trillian's going to come in and um, if any oh, questions, yes. I think you can type them up. Yeah, so absolutely. So maybe Lisa, if we um, jump off the screen share, um, that's probably easiest. And then just as a quick reminder to everybody, um, so you can submit your questions using the Q&A option at the bottom of the screen there. Um, if you're having real trouble, feel free to drop them in chat. I'll keep an eye on that as well. Those of you that are joining us this evening via Facebook, please pop your questions into the comments section there. And then we'll also, we'll, we'll bring them over and ask Lisa. Um, so I wanted to start out as we give everyone a chance to pop some questions in there with a question of my own, Lisa, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. So what do you think your grandmother would think of the book? How do you think she would feel about it? Well, I have to say, as I was writing the book, it's something that never crossed my mind. Um, and then once the book was out, and somebody actually did ask me this, and I sort of thought, oh my God, she might have hated it. She might, you know, really, I, I had a little panic attack, actually, and thought I should unwrite it. Um, because I worried that, you know, I hadn't asked her permission, you know, I'd sort of just done this thing all about her life. Um, but um, I did speak to some of my cousins in California and said, oh, no, no, you know, she'd have been very proud. And she was, um, she always had a bit of an inferiority complex. And I think this is why she took on this role of deciding to feed the family. She had to be the one to do it because she had to prove herself. She always felt that she wasn't as good as her older sister. She'd, Pearl had dropped out of school. She wasn't educated. And her sister had gone on to university and been very successful. Her brother, everybody adored. Um, and she felt that she was the unloved. She was a stubborn, awkward one. And she, she felt her father didn't love her as much as he loved the other children. Um, so I think she, you know, I hope she would actually love being the heroine of her, of her own book. Um, she, Ooh, I'm, sure she, I mean, I'm sure she would have told me, told, told me all the things I got wrong as well. And uh, she <laughs> wanted to have the last word, but I, I hope she would have been happy. Oh, well, I hope so. Definitely. Hearing that now, it seems all the more important to have written the book as well. 
Uh, so, so we've got a couple of questions uh, that have come in. Um, so one question was about whether or not your grandparents celebrated the Jewish holidays and whether they were observant and religious. And my grandmother, yes, absolutely. Um, the family was very observant and a large part of the, the, the first bit of the book is really about Jewish life. Um, in in the pale of settlement and you know everybody was observant it was you know you couldn't not be observant um I and mean, there, there was this sort of split between um those who um you know the the, the people who, the jews who joined the revolution because they wanted to protest about the discrimination and there were the others who led the old you know an old-fashioned life and really were unaware of events outside of you know the shul and you know the the rabbinical community and certainly my uh, pearl's father's side of the family they grew up in a um um in a rabbinical setting and um it dreamed of being rabbis and that that dream unfortunately was thwarted um her mother's side of the family were, were kind of more um, outward looking but still you know if, um you know, went to shul three times a day, you know, never missed a prayer meeting. And uh, yeah, very much so. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, so another question we've had is actually about your grandfather. Where did he come from? What's his story? I know very little about it. He's from a place called Missouri, um, also um, in, in Ukraine. He emigrated to also to Winnipeg earlier, um, about sort of nine or nine or ten years earlier than than Pearl did. I never met him. He died about ten years before I was born. Um, but um, he's. I, I have my my father did do a little bit of work on on his family history in in Missouri. Um, but it's not something that I've got enough information about. Unfortunately, nobody recorded those stories. Oh. <laughs> So the next uh, we've got, oh gosh, hold on. Okay, so let's let's do this one next. So there's a question um, about did your grandmother remain observant when she came to the US? Yes, she did. Yes, she did. Um, she uh, remained observant, yes, throughout her life. Um, my father uh, kind of re rebelled and um, and didn't. He he um, walked away from it. I mean, he's still married. You know, my mum's Jewish, and you know, he's still. He I don't think he could have got away with um, marrying a non-Jew. But um, um, yes, um, Grandma remained observant, and it's kind of got lost a bit in later generations. Right then, right. Understand entirely. Okay, so I think um, it seems that people are quite interested in hearing, I think, really about the, the research process. So we've got questions here about, did you find new relatives? Some, but someone's also asked questions about whether or not you've been able to get hold of civil, civil documents about your Ukrainian ancestors. So I wonder if you can really talk to sort of that part of, of, of the process of writing. Yeah, sure. I mean, I'll say, I'll say first up, I'm not a genealogist and it's not something I've pursued uh, because I, you know, I had these amazing stories land in my lap and I wanted to write the story. Um, so, you know, searching for documents isn't really something that, um, that I've got involved in. I think, you know, if I have more time when I'm, you know, when I retire, um, you know, at the moment life's pretty busy, you know, it's something I would, I would very much like to get into. Um, we do have an amazing stack of documents that somehow got kept by, you know, someone in the family, um, in a, in a distant link of the family. Um, uh, a whole stack of documents relating to the immigration process and all these letters between different uh, organizations um because we were, they were immigrating to canada um between the authorities in ottawa the authorities in winnipeg and um there were all kinds of problems and the, the immigration process was fascinating that's something I, I you know i have given talks about that in itself um and it's amazing to have all these documents that are now online um in terms of 
finding new relatives, my goodness me, it has been incredible. Um, I come from a really small family. Um, my dad's the only one in the UK from, you know, from, from that side of the family. Although I've now discovered I've got a, um, a cousin who's a rabbi in London who I've met a few times, you know, he's a third cousin twice removed or something. Um, I have cousins all over America and Canada and Israel. Um, and I've been, you know, so many of them have been in touch with me. And from where, from the time I spent in the Soviet Union, when I met, um, you know, made contact with cousins there, most of them have now, have since emigrated to Germany, and I'm still in touch with them, and, you know, I'm in touch with them regularly, and we've, you know, we've visited, um, and I took, went over with my mum and dad, and, you know, visited them in Germany after, soon after they immigrated from Kiev. Uh, but yet yeah, the family thing has been just <laughs> amazing. That's brilliant. Oh, wow. And and then also, though, so then just knowing that the book and these stories are just of such immense value to so many people. That's, yeah. that's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it, it has been... Um, it, it has been incredible and you know the amount of people in my family who've somehow heard about the book you know got hold of the book you know read the book not even knowing that it related to their family and then somehow looked at the family tree and realized that they um you know that they're that they're in it somewhere and so on that note i should also probably say one of our questions that came in has come from your cousin phil oh, um phil. <laughs> and i suppose less of a question and more of a statement and that he said that your grandmother would have loved um, that you wrote the book and would have been ever so proud of you. Um, oh, that's <laughs> lovely. Well, thank you, Phil. And Phil knew grandma so much better. He's my first cousin. He's my aunt Lil's son. And he knew grandma so much better than I did because they lived in Los Angeles and, you know, saw each other all the time. And, you know, as I said, I hardly knew her because we lived so far away. Oh, gosh. Well, I think possibly on that note, we might need to wrap it up, unfortunately. We are a little over our time. Um, Lisa, I'd just like to say again, thank you so much for being able to join us this evening and embracing the technology um, and, and helping us make this all happen. Um, as a reminder to everybody that is um, joining us this evening via Zoom, I'm going to pop a couple of links in the chat box right now. Um, so there is a link there to purchase a copy of Lisa's book that you can do through our JMM online store. So your um, purchase will also support the museum. And then I'm also just going to pop in um, a link there as well um, that anyone that would still like to donate to help us continue to make programs available online um, as we continue to adjusting to this, this new normal. So thank you everyone for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. And Lisa, thank you so much. Have a good evening. Thank, thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thank you.